so when you get up into the uh, getting back to the, the notions of a uh, uh, mid wit, high wit, low wit, uh, <laughs> yeah, the high wits, they've got some interesting uh, ways of bucking traditionalism that are not aligned with the woke or don't seem to be aligned with some of the woke's biggest passions. So, you know, in the, the Bay Area, the kind of rationalist community, which I believe almost certainly are higher than average uh, intelligence it's relative to, uh, you know, say a BuzzFeed journalist, they will often be into st stuff like uh, uh, cryonics or uh, polyamory or legalizing hard drugs, um, radical animal rights. In, in some ways, they're uh, still sticking up for a, kind of a 90s and 2000s era uh, progressivism, whereas progressivism in the mainstream has moved on to a, some race and gender almost entirely, almost exclusively. So you, so you. The point is that you get up into the, the very uh, highly intelligent realm, and you still get uh, certain notions that are anathema to a typical person. They just happen to be something that the woke are not aligned with either. So, do you think that their views are ultimately trustworthy on these because they're they're ultra intelligent, or are they led astray in a way that actually makes them a bit woke like on that? So again, polyamory. Okay, there's a there's a lot of questions there. This is like four questions, right? Um, okay, yeah, so let me try I, to separate I, this out. So are are the rationalist types trustworthy, or or are kind of like high end people trustworthy in general? Um, so that's one. Yeah. Number two is do they bear some similarities to the woke in terms of rejecting kind of instinct or tradition? Um, yeah. Number three is um, whether uh, number three is whether or no that okay so one oh my goodness this is this is a little bit confusing for me as well so so one is whether um, they're they're out of touch with ordinary people whether the rationalists are out of touch with ordinary people uh, two is whether they're similar to the woke in that way uh, three is whether uh, whether they're like in conflict with the woke or if there's this kind of like common origins point right. Um, yeah. And it might just be three. It might just be three. So let me just try to answer these. Let me just try to answer these in order. Um, so are, are, are rationalists out of touch? Um, I, I think just empirically, like looking at the survey, the answer is yes, right? Um, the, most, most Americans like meat. Most Americans don't really know about existential risk. Most Americans are not donating to like the malaria net charity, right? Um, so... And those are things that are all very popular within the rationalist community and things like polyamory or cryogenics. Those are also not necessarily common things. And I, I think it's because there's a lot of variation in other traits as well. I, I think rationalists tend to be, and I, I, I don't think I've got like a data point on this right now, but probably one exists out there. Um, they tend to be higher in, in trait openness. So um, they're much more amenable to kind of new experiences, things that they've never encountered before, uh, and lower on neuroticism. So they're they're less predisposed to react to uh, negative emotion. And uh, these things matter a lot. And of course, you can look at them as kind of like psychological traits and you can say like, okay, one is better, one is worse. But also these are kind of aesthetic preferences, right? It, it, it's preferences along the lines of what your taste in music is or what your taste in art is. Um, it doesn't really matter um, how intelligent you are, um, or I guess it, it can like have some influence, but in the end of the day, you'll have people who um, reject a type of sexual behavior, at least for themselves, and who people who accept the same type of sexual behavior um, for themselves, and this is just kind of like their preferences. So I don't think it's a matter of whether they should be trusted or whether what's good for them is good for everyone else, um, at least on these kind of um, at least on these kind of aesthetic questions, because these aren't really questions of like, oh, here is the absolute right answer. Um, there are some other points where I think they get a lot right, and I think society would benefit a lot from them, not just in these kind of aesthetic ways, but in, in just like measurable ways. So for example, um, the rationalists are very into existential risk. They talk about things like worrying about pandemics. Um, I, I think we've all learned a good lesson on that, that in fact, maybe we should have spent a little bit more on pandemic monitoring and have been a little bit better um, 
at uh, at detecting things, at at running um, at running challenge trials, at developing the vaccine even faster. Um, I think that a lot of what the effective altruists or the existential risk people, there's a big overlap. What they were discussing, I, I think a lot of what they were talking about was was just right. Um, and I don't. I think the thing is the parts that are not necessarily um, that aren't necessarily against kind of like most people's values. Um, the ones that are most productive are not necessarily um, are not necessarily kind of antithetical or or kind of like um, taboo. They're just kind of boring. Like if you ask someone in like 2017, 2018, like, oh, do you want to like come to come to a talk about pandemic preparedness? They'll be like, what? No, the, 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 there's so many things I'd rather do. Um, but as it turns out, it was quite important. Um, so do you have anything to say about that or should I just go on to, to part two? Uh, I would just I would just add real quick that, uh, yeah, that the, I, I feel like the, uh, the kind of rationalists are doing the valiant uh, job of sticking up for a kind of a broad humanistic liberalism with a clear technocratic bent. And that whole space seems to have been lost lately with a kind of weirdly parochial uh, culture obsessed progressive strata of, of influencers. So, um, yeah, liberalism yeah, with cool. a pro liberalism Sorry. with a humanist Sorry. bent. Yeah, I, I think so. I think humanist so. Bent. Yeah. And, and clearly, you know, the technocratic flavor is right in their wheelhouse because a lot of them are, you know, software engineers, uh, accomplished scientists and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, go on. Sorry. I'm not sure if I would, I'm not sure if I would go with the kind of technocratic. Uh, I do see that as a wing. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a question of whether, what you mean by technocratic. Um, so there's like technocracy in that, like, we thought about this. We looked at some statistics, and here's what we think is good. Like there, there's yeah. there's like persuasive technocracy, and then there's kind of like um, authoritarian um, technocracy. And I don't mean that as a pejorative. I just mean as in like wanting to use authority. And I don't think the rationalists are necessarily in the latter camp, but they're certainly in the kind of persuasive technocracy camp. Right. That, awesome. like, he, here's our here's our research paper. We think this is a good idea. You guys should you guys should do it. Um, but there, I I don't think they're the kind of people who would say like enforce, um, in, enforce like absolute dictates um, uh, upon other people. Right. Yeah. That's the problem with a loaded term like technocracy. Um, I, I guess yeah. I need to say that in 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 a sense, they were critical of you know official technocracy on uh, technocratic grounds. Like they would say things like you know, yes, <laughs> these are not. You know, uh, they're not. Uh, we're not using controlled trials. We're we're um, we're just yeah. We're basic yeah. Like like B J Campbell says, it, just, it seems to be dictated by uh, just the news of the day or the you know uh, yeah policy by Twitter. <laughs> one current thing after another, right? So they actually criticize technocracy or big science on technocratic and scientific grounds, which is uh, something yeah um, yeah you know progressives aren't doing. They you know they're just doing something else entirely. Like I said, they're not. They don't even seem to be informed by. It. Uh, kind of, you know, broad 20th century ideals of, of science uplifting humanity somehow. They're, you know, beyond all that now. Um, so, yeah, that's what I meant by that. Yeah. So the second question, I think, is is whether they're similar to woke in a way, right? And um, so yeah. it, it kind of really depends on on kind of how narrow your conceptualization of woke is, right? So the my kind of conceptualization, I think, is on the narrow end, which is basically people who are uh, hyper concerned at, about um, differences between uh, or, or between uh, sexes, um, races, um, genders, and believe that these differences are caused by uh, some kind of large quantity of racism, sexism, uh, etc., um, homophobia, you name it. Um, and I think that's the kind of narrow definition of woke. Um, there are some people who who broaden it to um, to include um, progressives in general, including like economic progressives. Um, there are some people who broaden it to include this kind of like corporatist, um, this kind of corporist kind of like authoritarian technocracy aspect. So some of the kind of COVID culture wars, um, I, I wouldn't include that as well. Um, and I think this is really kind of, uh, 
there's kind of a thing that happens where where a word becomes be, goes from being a fixed point to this kind of like vibe spaced thing to this kind of like um to this kind of expression of an emotional sentiment that can be legitimate but is is often very confusing and different depending on which person is actually using the word um so okay let, let's just try to kind of like decompose what we mean um into uh into like different words that have more stable meanings and actually just try to try to talk about it in that way so so what similarities are there between um between kind of rationalists and and this kind of like new um new like humanist movement uh and this uh and aspects of what different people might consider quote unquote woke so one is like what we're talking about in the first question there are these kind of like aesthetic out of touch things aesthetically out of touch things that just most people most people would not like um so that's one i think there is a kind of class dimension uh rationalists are a lot more urban are a lot more kind of um are a lot of are kind of um uh, college degree holders yeah. are um, probably higher income, uh, and uh, yeah. So there's this kind of class aspect, this this geography aspect. Yeah. So I think you could write a kind of let's say let, let's say that like the Democratic Party was kind of a lot more reasonable. And they were they were not really caring about identity, but they were instead caring about these kind of obscure technocratic issues, right? Or let's say they were like promoting like polyamory and they were po promoting like cryogenics, maybe like uh, animal rights. Actually, I think animal rights is a bit different in that it's actually it's it's kind of popular. There's a there's kind yeah. of a base for it. I, I I don't see it as being like kind of a very out of touch or like out of touch to the degree of like quote unquote woke or even other things like polyamory. Um, so let's just leave that one aside for now. But let's just say like the Democratic Party was very focused on esoteric issues. So let's say like, let's say like so some part of the rationalists ran the Democratic Party. Um, would there still be a kind of appeal that you could make by saying like, oh, these people are out of touch. These people are all living in coastal cities. They're kind of not caring about the ordinary person. They're kind of going against your traditions. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I, I can totally see that. Yeah, so but at the far, same time... Lot, so far, that overlaps a lot with the typical Republican criticism of Democrats. And yet, so so we haven't totally honed in on what the difference is. But yeah, so, oh, wait, we have, like, a third difference now. We have a third category, which is Democrats. And, and, and I think, like, this is the kind of shtick that I do whenever I go on any conservative show, is to talk about how, like, the Democrats are kind of, like, the, this... Are this like very large coalition where most of the people who are who are casually voting Democrat are like in deep disagreement with a lot of the cultural positions. So, for example, the majority of Democrats are against affirmative action. Um, uh, the majority of Democrats, or sorry, not uh, the affirmative action one was Biden voters. The majority of Biden voters is again are against affirmative action. Um, the majority of I think this one was Democrats are are like staunchly pro capitalism or overwhelmingly pro capitalism. Um, uh, and I think overwhelmingly, uh, Democrats are either in favor of the same amount of police or more police. Um, so you kind of have this, uh, small group of people who are kind of like professional Democrats, right? They're kind of like Democrats in the media. They're like Democrats TM. Um, and, and you get a lot of them who, who talk about these kind of obscure cultural positions. Uh, and actually, with politicians, it's not even that bad, right? Like Joe Biden talks about being anti-crime. Uh, he talks about um, he talks about um, being pro-capitalism, and you can you can hit him on other grounds. You can say he hasn't done inflation pop properly, or he's um, he he hasn't done like monetary policy effectively. You can criticize him on some of the other cultural grounds, but like a lot of politicians do kind of do do a fairly good job at like not being the kind of democrats tm or the the progressives tm right um or especially this this kind of like group of people who i call social progressives who who are kind of like who are kind of like the this um social issue focused cluster um so yeah that's another that's a, that's like another uh group 
that is that is also different. Um, and and I think with regards to similarities between the rationalists and the kind of like popular Democrats or like democratic, I don't want to say establishment because that's not quite the word either. The democratic like voter base, I think that's the right word, right? Um, yeah, I think there is a lot of over overlap in the critiques of those. Um, I don't know. You can ask yourself. You can ask yourself, like, how accurate are those critiques, and are are they more accurate towards the rationalists, or are they more accurate towards the wokes, or are they more accurate towards the the kind of like um, the kind of like um, party party voter, the kind of voter base. Um, I think it's least accurate towards the Democratic voter base. I think it's more accurate towards the rationalists. And I don't know. The thing is, like, the rationalists are almost kind of, like, more more operating in a way that is different from how normal people think. I, I think that that's true, and I think that ac that criticism is just true. Um, like I said, there's this way, there's these ways of kind of authority, there's reasoning by authority, there's reasoning by impulse, and there's reasoning by kind of like um, hard computation, basically, right? And the thing with hard computation is that it takes a lot of your time. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think that this critique is definitely one that applies to the rationalists, is that they're, they're like interested in topics that most people aren't interested in, and uh, they're they're thinking about things in a way that most people don't think about. And you, this isn't necessarily a value judgment, right? Like those ways can still be correct, but I think that that critique holds. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, their uh, their views are actually, yeah, I think in general, uh, further away from the typical person than than even the woke are, or rather, the woke push most people away for certain object level reasons, like uh, there's some kind some kind of problem with white people. But the fact that they're still thinking in those racial terms actually does better align with most people. It's the rationalists who are a bit uh, out to lunch relative to both, the typical person and the woke. But um, yeah, they've been they, they're referred to as gray tribe somewhat colloquially. And uh, so they're neither neither blue nor red. But uh, in actuality, they they come closer to blue tribe. They're kind of a metallic blue, I guess you could say. I don't I, I don't think so. This no. is just like kind of like, I mean, if you if you kind of associate blue with being like coastal or being out of touch, uh, then yeah. But in in another way, like in a in another way, left wing politics has like very like fundamental impulsive appeals, right? There's a reason why they're winning like around half of these elections, um, and and that's because like, um, especially when you look. I mean, okay, let's let's answer the question for the wokes because I think that's that's where this matters. Um, if you look at the behavior of people uh, of uh, demographic groups, especially racial or religious demographic groups in kind of developing countries, the wokes are kind of just doing like the most obvious thing. So if you look at like a country like Lebanon, oh. then Lebanon is a country which is rife with identity politics, and it's probably been rife with them or it certainly has been rife with them before we constantly were talking about identity politics in an American context. Uh, I had this I had this quote from a Wikipedia article. Actually, let me just search it up because I really think it's astonishing to I think most people with a kind of Western Western background. OK, so this is this is from the, the Wikipedia article for Lebanon. Lebanon's natural legislature is the unicameral parliament of Lebanon. Its 128 seats are divided equally between Christians and Muslims, proportionately between the 18 different denominations, and proportionately between its 26 religions. Prior to 1990, the ratio stood at 6 to 5 in favor of Christians. However, the okay, and then some agreement uh, changed it to be um, equal. Uh, Quite sectarian. <laughs> yes. And then uh, there, there's this other rule, and there are other rules uh, in in the same Wikipedia article that talk about specific religious um, backgrounds that um, each of the executives have uh, have to have as well. So, yeah, this kind of this kind of thinking by tribe or by by demographic group um, 
can come naturally in in many situations, especially in countries without, for example, without the rule of law, without a clear um, without a clear system of justice, without a clear uh, guarantee of individual rights. This is something that happens ex extremely uh, extremely frequently, and and so when you have this kind of pretty open demagoguery. When you are really, I think like this is not an exaggeration, but people who, and this isn't even kind of like the modern woke, this is just going back kind of since Lyndon B. Johnson, where the argument might have been, and might have been more legitimate, but basically like taking this entire set of problems that a group of people face and, and creating an enemy, creating like a, a direct scapegoat for it. Now, maybe you can say in like 1964, um, you can say that actually, yeah, racist Southerners were responsible for the problem. Um, but really keeping this this kind of uh, theory going long until uh, long until all of this is over, long until those laws have all been abolished and kind of keeping this going as kind of like the ghost of a theory or like now basically a conspiracy theory. It, it really is just kind of classic demagoguery, right? Um, it really is just kind of classic, classic like third world racial demagoguery. Yeah, that's what that's and, why it bothers a lot of people. They see right through to the to the logic of it. You know, it, it's dressed up as this sort of a inclusive thing that any you know modern well functioning. Uh, it's it's not even though like. But it's not. Yeah. Yeah, like it's it's not even especially when they're making their appeal to these groups in specific they're not even making these appeals in kind of like a broad coalition way. Maybe they're talking about that when they're running kind of like uh, presidential campaigns. But of course, if you look at any uh, classic demagogue, um, they, they speak they speak out of both sides of their mouth. They talk to one group of people in one way. And you, you look at the Democratic Party's rhetoric towards either either Asians or African-Americans. And it's just... It it is just like it's not even hidden. It's just like explicit. I, I'm very skeptical of whenever people on on either side say like, for example, like the the broad left wing, and here I do mean the left wing, not just kind of social progressives. The broad left wing has this idea of um, quote unquote dog whistles, which I think is deeply mistaken. Which is like, oh, um, Republicans can't do demagoguery uh so they're just gonna like they're, they're they're gonna do like conservative economic policies and that's going to appeal to people's like racist sentiments like no if you actually just like study the third world if you if you know anything about history that just doesn't work the thing with demagoguery is that it's visceral it's like you have to just say the thing and in fact people don't even care if you do the demagoguery like people don't care if like trump actually builds the wall they care about you saying the thing and so look, these kind of quote unquote dog whistles are the, are the opposite of how this works. And like you get the same thing on the other side with like James Lindsay or whatever saying like, oh, these, these things are actually alluding to this kind of like secret plot. Um, and, and that's not how this works either. Like like if things are if it's difficult to coordinate these things. Winning elections is much harder than you think. People don't care nearly as much as you think. They're not paying attention nearly as much as you think. And if you want to do demagoguery, you kind of have to do demagoguery explicitly. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of a this, that was a little bit of a side note, but I think that's very yeah. important to say. Yeah, no problem. Um, well put. Uh, we're coming up on an hour now. Uh, well, one p.m. and uh, so I think I'm going to wrap it up. Is, is there anything else you want to add? We've packed a lot in here. It's been very good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do want to talk about the new podcast and uh, okay. my newsletter. I guess. Um, so for a while now, I've written the Metapolitics newsletter. Uh, it is at, you can find it at cactus.substack.com, uh, just the word cactus.substack.com. Um, and uh, I, have, uh, I have this new podcast is coming up. It is the From the New World podcast. Yes. We talk about how institutions are changing, how, how social movements have, uh, are completely distinguished, are completely um different from how they were before and how these kind of new social effects arise because of hyper connectivity because of all of the new things that we have now all of this technology that we have creating a world where um we can go from zero to like reaching millions of people in in seconds really 
So you can find that at from the new dot world. You can also find a link from uh, my Substack, which I already talked about. But uh, I should also talk about the guests I'm interviewing about these institutions, about these effects. So we have Robin Hansen, who's just a brilliant ec economist. He's at uh, George Mason University. And he has this idea of prediction markets, which is this new way of uh, organizing the world. You might have heard the phrase, a, ta um, a bet is a tax on bullshit. And, and really creating these systems where people who make mistakes or, or people who lie are really punished for it. And that and a lot of other things that we talk about are extremely interesting. Uh, we have Steve Shu talking about how we learned and then forgot about human intelligence. Um, about really things that should be kind of basic knowledge should be, I think, included in any kind of psychology textbook. Um, and, and that really should be taught to kind of every student who's going through um, public school as kind of foundational knowledge about how the way our world works. And then also the institutions, um, the institutions that have kind of came together in order to really, really create this kind of like, create this kind of um, false narrative um, that is against it. Um, and then finally, we have Richard Nania, which I think you mentioned off the top of the show, uh, yeah. huh. where who is I think maybe he's more familiar with your with your audience. He's someone who's definitely uh, talking about politics almost all of the time, and yeah. Yeah. we just had a completely wide ranging conversation from um, how civil rights law makes almost everything illegal to um, the feminization of society and uh, me pushing back on that arguing whether it's um, whether it's really a kind of change in your social in your kind of uh, psych psychological profile, whether it's whether the root causes feminization or whether it's more or something like an increase in neuroticism. Um, I, I think I lost that exchange, but uh, it's it was still definitely interesting. Yeah. And we talked a lot about um, Richard's work and the kind of way he uh, makes sense of the world as well. So I think all three episodes are really well worth checking out. And those episodes will be out on Monday. They will be out on uh, Monday, May the 2nd. And of course, the newsletter is always there, cactus.substack.com. Um, it has been there for, I think, more than a year now, and it will be there for years to come. <laughs> Great. Cool. Uh, thanks, uh, Cactus, 